Welcome to Archives Month 2024. This year's theme is Lights, Camera, Rala, and we're going to be exploring the relationship between Rala and Missouri and the film industry. I'm the coordinator for the Rala Research Center. I'm actually based here in Rala. So tonight we're going to be talking about rotoscope. If some of you grew up in and around Rala and were here in like the early to mid 60s, maybe some of this is familiar. I've seen some eyes. Maybe I won't point anybody out. Um, but for um, a lot of us, rotoscope um, is actually kind of a different film technology. So rotoscoping was used as an animation technique. So animators would actually trace over motion picture film to get some like of the more complicated either fight or dance sequences. So it's developed in the 1915, but then in the 1930s is when it's used a lot in things like Popeye or Betty Boop. So in some of those fight and dancing scenes. Um, is where it really became popular, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. Our rotoscope is a completely different type of technology, and it's just named after its inventors, Ro Carney and Tom Smith, R-O-T-O. We are very, very creative with the technology, less so with the name a little bit here. So here's our two inventors, Ro Carney Jr. Um, I was actually fortunate enough to talk to a relative this week who says he mostly went by Jr. Um, with his father in town, very well known. He was mostly Jr., but they met in the 1940s working in the Rollamo Theater here in town. So the Rollamo was actually owned by Jr.'s father, also Ro Carney, but he was known as Doc. And then um, Tom Smith actually came up here to work in the 1940s. World War II took both of them away. They both ended up serving during the war in different capacities and then found themselves back here in the 1950s. So a little bit more about Roe. So he grew up in the in the theater business. His father owned several here in town, including the Rollamo, the Uptown Theater. He owned several and he owned the theater in St. James, one in Lebanon as well. And for a very brief time down in Springfield, um, he had other concerns like the Tiger Hotel in Columbia. He owned that for a little bit. He owned a hotel down in Springfield as well. He bought the town of Arlington, was kind of here, there, and, and everywhere with a bit of it. So Roe actually took some of that and transferred it to Army. So he actually worked as a projectionist and showed a lot of films in San Francisco during the war, um, was kind of his job, and then came back and ended up working as a manager at some of the hotels, but then also the theaters as well. Tom Smith, um, so he's born in 1914 up in Kansas City, and he gets his start in the theater in Humansville. His family moves there when he's fairly young. So Humansville is a small town down southwest Missouri direction. Um, so he grew up there, was working in it. His brother actually worked for the National Theater Company up in Kansas City as well. So there's a lot of connection within his family. But um, less so on the managing side, Tom was much more of the... Um, as Roe liked to call him, the tinkerer. He was kind of the engineer behind this. So he actually did a lot of work himself on other kind of creative theater projects um, prior to the rotoscope. So if you can see here in this bottom photograph is actually his drive-in movie theater experience that he put in in Urbana, Missouri. So that's just north of Springfield. So instead of everybody driving up, lining up and having one big screen that everybody viewed, instead each car, he put it in a circle, projector, projector was in the center, and then each car had its own individual screen and, and your um, speaker that would be right beside by your car. So you had your own individual screen. And this one was actually a, a smaller setup. Um, he ended up, it was called the autoscope. So he ends up doing a version of this actually out in New Mexico later on after the rotoscope um, invention that he does here, which houses like over 300 cars. It could um, do that. So, and there was plans to continue to expand, but it started getting to the period where drive-in theaters were less and less popular. So it didn't quite take off as he wanted it to. So a little bit of, of a history of this. Um, so they've both got theater backgrounds, but the rotoscope itself really doesn't um, take off until 1953. So the kind of interest in actually making film comes from Doc 
Carney for Roe. His father, as I mentioned earlier, actually bought the town of Arlington um, here in Phelps County. There was kind of some idea of making it a movie set. So he, you know, reached out to executives, directors in Hollywood saying, hey, I've got this really great Ozark town. You're kind of in the time period where a lot of these like rural comedies are starting to come up in um, popularity. So he's trying to pitch this. It never really takes off, but Doc actually creates, he creates two known um, scripts for movies, one of which he actually convinced George Merrick of Treasure Island fame director to come out to Arlington to, to actually shoot this film. And there is um, archive up in St. Louis that has some remnants of this film. It's pretty poor quality because the, the film had deteriorated so poorly, but here you can actually see um, Doc's the, the white haired gentleman that you have at the back to it. And then George Merrick's the one kind of facing in my direction with the camera. So Rose kind of already got this, not just managing a theater, but also the wanting to create film um, in his blood. So in 1953, drawn by a new, newish, it came out in 52, uh, film technology known as Cinerama. So as you can see kind of here for the pictures, it shows it has this giant curved screen. And for this technology, it actually used three separate cameras to record a scene and then three separate projectors to then project onto the screen. And it was it was wildly popular. They would have like action scenes, as you can see here, um, some ladies skiing, which I would like to have seen how that happened um, in the 1950s. But um, what he took away from this was actually that he thought he could do it a little better because there was three separate cameras, three separate projectors, the timing, you had three separate operators on each of these, the timing had to be precise. The films didn't quite line up on the scene. So you can already kind of see the, the bending, there's a little warping, they usually it was blurred a little bit. So it wasn't a seamless scene necessarily on there. And he thought he could do better and actually get it all into just a single reel of film. So using that, he, when he comes back, Ro and Tom are now both working at the theater. So he brings Tom on board. Tom had actually just come out with his wagon wheel design down in Urbana in 53. So, you know, he had to have seen that probably in the newspapers. Maybe they were still in contact with each other, reach out, they reconnect and start working on this idea of how they can possibly make this technology work. They kind of scrap together a lot of odds and ends. Roe ends up buying an old um, 35 millimeter camera off of his father that he probably used at Arlington down for redemption. And then also a series of mirrors and lenses that they can use for some of their inventions. So from about 1953 to 1958, they worked together on what was then they called the um, Smith Carney system. And that's what you see on all of the patents as well. And then in the product, the um, publication of it and publicity, then they started using the rotoscope. I guess that sounded better than the, Ro or the Smith Carney system on that. So here you can actually kind of see um, some of the different scenes that they had filmed. And then this is a stitched up version of one of their scenes from um, Pine Street of what they were able to actually capture on film. So here is what they were able to accomplish. So this particular scene uh, was actually part of some of the original film footage that Gene Carney, who is Junior's son, um, he was the one that ended up with all of the materials at the end after his father had passed away in the 90s. And then he took it upon himself to kind of resurrect some of this. So he actually digitized, he built his own telecine machine so that he could digitize some of the film just using his digital camcorder. And then he set up a screen, a curved screen, in his garage so that he could actually show some film to family. So he was able to, you know, kind of bring his father back to this. So here we are actually touring Pine Street and you can see kind of the curved effect and the fact that you can actually see a little bit more of the facades of some of the businesses in town. See any familiar buildings maybe some buildings that aren't familiar any or aren't there anymore so here we're passing scott's drugs the ben franklin 
these two buildings no longer stand, right? Parking lots as we go up. I just like all the cars. Here we're coming up towards what was then still the post office, now the public library, which we will be at for our event on the 29th. And it's good to see that the parking on Pine Street is still as little bit as chaotic as it is today. You know, some things haven't changed at the very least. And so during this time period, um, Pine Street is actually still part of 66, so you can see kind of remnants of that in the service station and the gas station there. You see Woolworths up ahead. But yeah, so part of what the innovation was that they had was not just the technology, but how to go about using the technology. So they did a lot of these demonstration films because they wanted to be able to show the versatility. How can filmmakers and directors actually use this in a real motion picture, full length film? So this one, he's actually strapped to the hood of his car. Luckily, um, as you can see from the projector attachment that I have displayed over there in that case, that is solid steel plates. Luckily, we have a very strong intern who helped us get that in there. <laughs> um, and also cars were made a little bit bigger, a little bit sturdier in the late 50s, early 60s. So it could stand up to that and then a large 35 millimeter camera just to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like. So here to my right is one of the early prototypes for the camera attachment. So they had varying um, different types of prototypes that they use. So they tried different links, different uses of can of the lenses and mirrors to try and get just the right angle and view that they wanted. And then this other more modern picture is actually it strapped to the front of Gene Carney's truck um, using his tiny little, I don't know if you can see the little digital camera on there. Um, so he actually hooked it all back up, strapped it to his truck, and then drove some of the back roads, thankfully, of St. James and kind of uh, southern Phelps County, just to see if it still worked with a modern camera, and it did. So here you can see some of the more other prototypes that we use, some of them strapped to the car, some of them on more rigs, so you can actually walk around, you can have it stationary. Um, again, they were really targeting this towards Hollywood what would they actually be needing to use this for and, and different scenarios that they might want to use. So here you can see the two of them and this kind of little slice is what the actual film strip looks like. So that's a single frame. So you can see here at the top. Um, so this is actually how it plays through on its, it's upside down and it's inverted, which when I digitize some of these, I had to explain like this looks weird all, like these guys have been in the industry for years like we have seen nothing like this i'm like yeah i figured you would and i can't really explain until you saw it so um so you have kind of the center what would be your center frame and then you have your two sides that would then invert onto the other sides of there i don't know if i explained that well but i do have graphics that sh to show that later and explain it so much better i'm a visual person so here's actually the projector attachment. Uh, as you can see this also, it's in the far case back to behind you. Also plate steel, also quite heavy. I usually get quite a workout just lifting that thing out. But the series of mirrors and lenses that they used, and there's all sorts of minute adjustments that they can make to make the projector. Because again, they're trying all kinds of different frames, angles, lenses when they're actually shooting this film. So when they did a demonstration reel, they had to do some minute adjustments when they were actually showing it to people. So they built all of that in so that they were able to do that. Here you can kind of see some of the schematics of how the projector attachment actually works. I can do a lot more oohs and ahs like with the film engineers are like, oh yes, I get it now. I'm like, good, good. This is so much better than me trying to explain it to you. So I will put this up and then here is the camera attachment. So these are from the actual patents that they put out. So they patented all three of their different designs. So they had the camera attachment, they had the projector attachment, and then they found once they started trying to project it, they actually had to create their own screen material um, because the material that was used in a regular theater 
it reflected light too badly. So here you can see the screen and just how big of a curve it was. So they were getting some light reflection from one curve to the other, and it was just it was just throwing it off. So they ended up making this quite a rough textured screen material that kind of absorbed some of that light reflecting, refracting so it doesn't um, shine on there and, and mess up their picture. And then the smaller picture that you see down here with the whole group of people, they actually reached out to movie executives, movie theater owners, directors from all across the country and invited them to Rolla to actually see a screening of that. And they got they got quite a number of people who showed up for this um, to see the, the grand showing, which happened in May 1961, was kind of their, their grand opening of this demonstration film. So as I promised, here are some of the graphics that kind of show how it actually ends up lining up. So beyond just inviting people down, they had stories in the newspapers. They were in um, some theater magazines as well. They were promoting themselves. They were really putting this out there, hoping someone would bite, would invest in their um, invention here and actually take off with it so that they could do something. So here you can see some of the patents. Um, they were so confident in themselves that they got patents, not just in the United States, but in several countries as well. Um, so here you can see one that they had in Japan and Germany. So they kind of went for the countries that had some major motion pictures, where uh, locations of where they were being actually shot um, that they thought they might pick up. So I think they had about 10 countries overall that they submitted patents for. So the first showing, as I mentioned, happens May 13th, 1961 at the Rolamo Theater. So as you can see here, they had the big uh, marquee out front showcasing it. And it didn't just happen at the Rolamo. They ended up showing it also at the Uptown Theater and then at the theater in St. James. And then for one um, showing that also did it down in Springfield. The kind of trouble with some of this was you had to completely retrofit your theater. Um, you know, usually it's a theater, you have just one theater um, per location, and you have to set up this giant curved screen. And because of how it projected, it also had to be completely level with the screen. So most projection happens from above and all the way at the back of the theater. These, they had to build a separate projection booth for it so it could be level and centered with the screen. I think that's kind of where they had some of their downfall with movie theater owners was they would have to dedicate their entire theater to just this one type of film. It makes me think of like when IMAX and 3D started coming out of that sort of investment is like, well, if you have a lot of movies being made in rotoscope format, that works, but they weren't having that, um, that buy-in just yet. So they continued to show their film. And I think I had a couple, at least a couple of nods of people who were here, maybe in the mid late sixties that he actually did showings of it for school groups. Um, so you can see here kind of the tickets for the, the kids. He would set this up outside. He'd set it back up in local theaters and then just invite local kids and the community to come and view this. Again, um, Roe was really still invested in this up through the sixties. Um, by the late sixties, Smith had kind of pulled back on some of it because he wanted to go ahead and just start selling tickets, start making maybe their own movies and, and getting some money off of that. But Roe wasn't willing to do that. He was really waiting for that big, you know, movie executive to come in and say, yes, we want to take this and we want to make this happen. Unfortunately, it never actually happened. He even got a, you know, a letter from Howard Hughes back saying, you know, this sounds very interesting, but nobody, nobody was, was taking, um, a lot, a lot of really great feedback, both in the media and from movie executives, but no one was really taking the risk. Um, you're kind of at the heyday of movies. They're like, Hey, we're making money doing what we're doing already. This is too much of a, of a risk to take. Um, and so nobody, nobody really bought into it for this. But there is kind of a legacy for this. I think it really shows um, some great historic images of Missouri. So we just had that one scene right there of Pine Street, but he actually straps this whole contraption to the hood of his car and goes through Jefferson City. So you can see the Capitol in the early 60s, up past the Missouri State Pen, 
He records a lot on the Mississippi River. You can see the Admiral up at St. Louis. He goes down Olive Street in St. Louis, which is really, I think, some of the, the greatest footage because you can just imagine this car driving with this contraption and you just see all of the passerbyers. <laughs> just kind of the looks on their faces. You get a lot of that. He um, created some sort of a cart that unfortunately I don't have a photo of that he took here on campus. So I've got some really great footage of campus as well. And again, it felt like he was kind of following this poor student who's just, again, you know, watching like, I, what is happening um, going on? Uh, he goes across the Missouri River, um, goes to a couple of the state fairs, both here in Missouri and Illinois. So if nothing else, he's capturing history at that point, and he's doing it from a very unique angle. And I think it's just showing the um, innovation of Missourians. You know, maybe this didn't take off like they had hoped they would, but it really showcases some of the really great, amazing minds that we have that come out of Missouri. And then it's a kind of continuing, continuing legacy of preservation. So here's Gene in the 90s, whenever he ends up buying out the rights to rotoscope from his siblings and he gets all of the film reels, that's the telecine machine that he built. And it becomes just another family story. He's actually able to then share this with some of his siblings who were younger than him that don't didn't quite remember it happening. He was able to share it with his children of kind of what um, he remembered growing up as a child and then what also his father did. And then in um, about 2017, 2018 is when I started talking with Gene is when um, he then decided to actually donate the materials um, to State Historical Society. And we were able to take those in. And because of that, um, we were actually able to see some of this. All of these are now, they're not stored in these rusty old canisters anymore. I promise. That was one of the first things I did. I'm like, no, no, I have to get them out of here. These are awful. I don't know where they've been stored. Um, but also um, a couple of years ago, I was able to get a... National Film Preservation Foundation grant to digitize four of them and also to create film print copies. So that's some of the, the footage that we're seeing tonight and also some that I have um, available down in the office if anybody wants to see any more of the footage as well. But that just allowed for greater conservation of these materials and then also access because I don't know about you, but setting up a 35 millimeter film projector and trying to show that, especially this type of film that I then have to get an attachment for it it makes it a lot more complicated. So this just makes it a little bit more accessible and ensures that that stuff is preserved for future generations, not just preserved, but also accessible and for people to use. So here is my contact information. If anybody has questions, if anybody wants to see any more of the rotoscope stuff, but I did have a little bit more to show. So the next chapter in the rotoscope story includes a entry on film atlas so this is through the international film federation um, site there is going to be kind of an encyclopedia entry for rotoscope on there so it's an international encyclopedia that people will know a little bit more about roe and tom and their rotoscope technology so this actually was put together by a film engineer at disney I did not know this was happening, but the the people that I'm I'm working with on just encyclopedia entry were like, hey, we sent this here. Is this OK? And I said, absolutely. Yes, please do. Because um, I think it's just a really great way to show kind of without the full curved screen and, and projector attachment of a little bit of what it was supposed to look like. So this is actually um, the wooden roller coaster up at Forest Park in St. Louis how they talked anybody into letting them strap a camera and a film attachment. Like It's one thing for it to be on your own car, but we're going to do this on a roller coaster. And I can't imagine ever feeling confident enough to be like, all right, yeah, we're good. Go ahead and send it. Like the nerves, like, is it going to make it to the end? Um, and this isn't the only crazy footage. You saw all the car scenes, but he also straps it to the bottom of an airplane out at what was Vichy Airport, now Rolla National Airport, and sends it on a loop kind of up above the airport before it lands as well. It survived both encounters somehow miraculously, uh, and that could be why it ended up being the plate steel that it was. So it's a little bit sturdy there, um, and was sure going to 
survive on that. Um, I wish this clip still had the um, sound, but apparently it unfortunately didn't work because they are screaming. There are people on this ride screaming the entire time, uh, which is just great. So we're still working on that part of getting that added back into this. So this will also be part of that film Atlas entry. So people around the world will be able to see kind of what it's actually supposed to look like as well. So here we're back up in St. Louis um, and you get a little bit of the, you know, people on the, on the sidewalk staring, wondering what's going on. I can't be the strangest thing they've seen in St. Louis. But I think part of this we get on Olive Street. Um, and I don't know if anybody lived or spent any time in St. Louis in the kind of early 1960s, but I know for my former coworker, Carol, who grew up there, she was, you know, oh, I know that store. Oh, yeah. No, that one's gone now. And so I think if nothing else, just that that preservation of some of that Missouri history, that nostalgia. It's one thing to see it in photos. It's a whole different thing for it to actually be in film, I think. But yeah, I guess I will let you guys keep watching, but also open the floor to questions if anybody's got any. Did I, did I explain it all well? Yes, Larry. And there was just no real follow up, or if there if there was, Roe wasn't interested in that. Um, he was very keen on someone investing and taking it kind of lock, stock, and barrel, and moving forward with it. And I think that's why him and Tom ended up splitting uh, there at the end. There was um, kind of a brief time in the early 90s, just before his death, that he and his son, Gene, kind of partnered up and they actually got a kind of proposal from SeaWorld out in California to come and do a full kind of display at one of their uh, new opening exhibits. So it would have the curved screen. They would use the technology to film. But it ended up being um, pretty risky. Like he was paid a flat fee for ev everything, for his work, for getting out there, for doing the filming, for actually building the screen and all of that. So it could have been the big break. But for him, it was it was too much of a risk. He had young kids and he just or he um, he was, you know, at retirement at this point and just. I think I think he'd lost a little bit of um a little bit of the heart in it. Um he just just didn't have it in it. So I know that was kind of a a big bummer for his son, but he just wasn't wasn't up for it. And you know, looking at it probably wasn't a bad idea because it, it it could have ruined it. It could have been the breakthrough that got it out there again, but yeah, unfortunately it didn't go through. This question from Zoom. Yes. They would like to know if the Missouri State Fair footage has been digitized. Okay, if the Missouri State Fair footage has been digitized. I do have a few scenes of that. I believe it is, no, I think it was the Illinois State Fair um, that we have some of the digitized footage of, of some of the um, steam engines there, uh, but the Missouri State has not. Yes, Debbie. Wasn't there a plan at one point to make an actual movie with the technology and not just shooting scenes of places? Yeah. So for those on Zoom, Debbie asked if there was a plan to actually make a movie. So, yes, they had a bit of a script and it was more... Um, not that they wanted to actually make a full movie, but they wanted to show what it would look like if you were to film a movie. So they had kind of a basic script... They got some local people to be actors and actually ran through scenes. And I think that's a little bit, um, and talking with, with uh, his son, Gene, is probably where it fell flat a little bit for movie executives. Because if you have this great 180 degree, but everybody's just standing there kind of in front and there's not a lot of movement, it kind of loses like, well, why do we have all of this going on? So he thought, you know, had they done more 
action scenes, car chases, stuff like you see with the roller coaster or the or the plane. That might have been the way to go as far as marketing it. Um, but I can imagine that those were difficult scenes to shoot, so it didn't happen as much. But yeah, there are some scenes in there um, where it shows they've got a couple of local actors who are are playing out some scenes as well. Yes. Follow up question: Are there plans to digitize all of the video? Are there plans to digitize all of it? So I would love to. Um, a lot of it, it comes down to funding because um, it's several thousand to get um, even a single one. I think I had about 20,000 in that film, National Film Preservation Foundation grant to get those four. Some of that did go into the um, making of the film print copies, which was just part of the grant process that we had to do. Um, but yeah, so it costs and it's definitely on my mind and, and something I, I'm always looking for new grant opportunities to try and get some more of those digitized as well. Have you watched the footage of the campus? Yes, if you want to see some of the campage footage, I unfortunately don't have it here. <laughs> I wish I had thought ahead and, and done that, but um, let me know. I can pull it up. There's just some, some really great, just kind of along the sidewalks. He's not driving crazy through campus, not, <laughs> thankfully. Um, there's more crazy scenes of him driving a little bit through town and whatnot. Um, but yeah, there's some really great images of some of the buildings and stuff on campus. Okay. Thanks everybody for coming. And I hope you check out some of the exhibits. If you've got questions, I'll be around. Um, and we hope to see you for our next event on October 8th with Dr. Larry Gregg and then future events on the 22nd and 29th as well. Thank you.